Hey, Shalom family out there. Most High in Christ bless you all. Happy Sabbath. And for the family here in Tulsa, Most High in Christ bless. Happy Sabbath. Okay, today's class is entitled Bittersweet Wisdom and the rest of it. I pray today's class will be edifying. Let's give thanks to Captain Get Alive for the title of the class. <laughs> All right, let's... Um, so for wisdom... Um, Here's the thing with wisdom. We all want it, right? All right. With it comes great responsibility. With wisdom, it begins to reveal things to you that you understand. You start to get to understand the totality of what this Bible is talking about. And I could be honest with you. As you learn, a lot of it could be grim. <laughs> it could seem grim at least. All right? So as you go in understanding, it, 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 should, it should mature you. As you grow in knowledge of God's will, it should mature you to understanding the severity of what we're taking on and the price we pay for getting wisdom. All right? Let's begin the book of Second Ezra. Chapter 6. A verse uh, 57. This is the book of 2nd Ezra, chapter 7, and verse 57. Then answered he me and said, This is the condition of the battle which man that is born upon the earth shall fight, that if he be overcome, he shall suffer as thou hast said. But if he get the victory, he shall receive the thing that I say. For this is the life whereof Moses spake unto the people while he lived, saying, Choose thee life that thou mayest live. So watch this. In verse 57. I'm so, uh, okay, do me a favor. Uh, Cap, start with verse 56. I'm going I'm to read that real quick. Yes, sir. This is Second Ezra chapter 7 and verse 56. For while we lived and committed iniquity, we considered not that we should begin to suffer for it after death. I don't know, that scripture always went on scripture that always rattles me. That those that commit iniquity, we're going to suffer for it after death. You would think death is the problem. No, it's after death is where the problem arises. That's when the judgment comes. And, and we fully don't grasp what that is. In gaining wisdom, it should strike a chord in you that God is saying, after I kill you, you're going to suffer for your sins. Okay, now verse 57. Verse 57. Then answered he me and said, this is the condition of the battle. Okay. To obtain the kingdom, he's making clear there's a condition for the battle in front of you. Read on. Which man that is born upon the earth shall fight. Which man on this earth is going to fight. There's no way around this. This is the only way to get that prize. Read on. That, if he be overcome, he shall suffer as thou hast said. If you are overcome with evil, you're going to suffer. Here's wisdom now. If you understand that, and if you, wisdom is important upon you, you would understand that if you overcome in sin, you're going to die and then you're going to pay a punishment for what you did. Well, damn, your death might be a horrible death. That's nothing. There's something that's coming after that. Somebody with wisdom would understand it, and it's, it would strike a chord in them, I would think, that there's something to come after. Read on. But if he get the victory, he shall receive the thing that I say. Which is the kingdom. When you read back the chapter, read on. For this is the life whereof Moses spake unto the people while he lived, saying, Choose the life that thou mayest live. So he's telling you, I would advise you to choose life. Let's go just real quick. Go to the book of Deuteronomy 30. Book of Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. This is the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30, 
in verse 15. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. We don't. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. So he said, I record this in heaven. Choose this day, life or death, that thou and thy seed may live. That again should strike a chord in you. Because he's like, okay, I die. He's saying that you and your seed can live. He's like, I will kill you, and the effects of that will affect your seed. Wisdom now, as you take it in this understanding, I'm trying to find a word. There should be something in each and every one of us that has a healthy fear of God, that we know his words are not just ink on a page, that those words are going to come to life. When you first come in, you're like, oh, you kind of hear it. But when you watch people fall away from this, in this truth, into madness, you should be praying to God, never take that spirit from you. The effects of it is not just you. He said, what, that's the last verse, that you and your seed, read the last verse. Verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, Blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. He said that thou and your child, your seed, might live. Read on. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him. For he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. So he swear to our fathers to give us this land, but he said that thou mayest love the Lord thy God and that thou mayest obey his voice and thou mayest cleave unto him. He's telling us we must cleave unto him in all things. Direct our life to the observing of God's commandments, that thou mayest live and thy seed may live. Now, sometime in life, you know, some people get so far gone in their sins, ah, they don't have no fear of God. But I would think there's something that's in every one of us that would worry about our own children. I've witnessed people leave this truth, leave this body, where this was their safety. This is where they were raising their children up in and because of their own selfish ways, sinful ways, they destroyed everything. You know what it is to pull your child away from its base of what it's known? A child is raising its truth, that's being raised up. That's all they know. And because of your ways, you uproot them and tear away whatever foundation they had in relationships and friendships, your wives. They says, man... Not only will I punish you, but I will punish your children. Now, here's the thing about wisdom. If you don't give a damn about yourself, you don't got wisdom. But if you don't give a damn about yourself, you would think you would think about how your actions will directly affect your children. These are the same people that came in, and this word was sweet to them. They heard the word, oh, yeah, give me that precept and this and that. And whatever struck in their life, whatever happened to them, whatever they wouldn't accept, the ramifications are going to be generational. So when you're moving in wisdom, 
and you grow in wisdom, you start understanding your actions have ramifications that far exceed even you. Then the words are supposed to get bitter in your stomach a little bit now. All that good here and those precepts, the color of Christ. Now you start getting a little more understanding. God said, listen, I'm not going to get you. I'm going to get your children. That don't strike a chord in anybody in here? Okay, good. All praises. So now what you going through real quick, 1 Corinthians 10. So the point I was talking about was uh, in it next is the cleaving unto him. 1 Corinthians 10. Because <clears throat> I think about that for myself. What would I want to see for my children? You know, uh, no tempt- uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 13. This is the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 10 and verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So remember he's talking about, uh, read our next verse. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. So remember we read earlier, can you turn my mic, yellow mic? Remember we read earlier in Deuteronomy, it says about them serving other gods, right? So here's the point. He said there's no temptation that is, that is common to man. Here's the point. God always gives you a way to escape out of it. There's always some place in this trial you're going through that there's a way out. Sometimes it's with the class you hear. You hear something that's supposed to, if you have wisdom, it'll resonate to you and it'll strike something and you say, you know what? I got to rethink how I'm moving. No, Lord, forgive me. I'm going to get my stuff together. Sometimes it's a conversation you have with a brother. And he'll say something to you that'll trigger you. There's, oh, there's nothing that you can't go through that you don't realize there's always an out. You understand? So when people fall away, it's because they just don't take the out. They will hear it. They would hear it in class or whatever. They'll take notes. Their Bible will be highlighted up. But they will not act upon their way out. And then the effects could be generational. It affect you, your children, your children's children. I'm going to you. I'm gonna tell you something. There was a brother many years ago, before we even started this congregation, that I was very close with. And his son was being raised up with my sons. My, one of my sons used to call him dad because he was so close. He thought I was his father. He was always around him. Anyway, he fell away many, many years ago. And his son, this boy was sharp. He was maybe five, six years old and would sit through classes like this. He didn't sit in We didn't have kids' classes then. You sat through adult classes. And he had retention at five, six, seven years old. He had a retention of these scriptures. He was paired with my oldest son in those age groups. His father made decisions that moved him away from the Lord. And 15, 20 years, I forgot how long, 15 years later, my sons ran into him. And all that he understood back then is gone. And he said, oh, I remember this was a time when, yeah, I remember when they used to have tents. And we used to say, he didn't know what it was. And my kids are talking to him, and he's like, yeah, because they saw my Passover. Oh, yeah, and they, that was right. Then used to get the, we used to eat some bread and some stuff. And they just looking at him and don't realize this guy. And this kid, when I say was sharp, this kid was so sharp. It was, used to marvel the elders back then. This kid was, and his father's decision, that boy is gone now. Now imagine when he has children. Because of, because of decision, because of what? Not learning to fear of the Lord. Not understanding that wisdom that you took in, how your actions affect. There's always, an, and you know what happened? Here's the point. I'm, I'm going long-winded. Before the father fell away, I spoke to him and I told him, I said, yo, listen, I know what you think, but I'm telling you you're making a mistake. And I'm talking like, his, like we, we brethren, we friends. I'm like, yo, listen to me. Don't do what you're doing. I'm telling you it's a mistake. And he was sealed in his mind. He wouldn't do it. And now today, son is a metrosexual-looking guy. I don't know what you know. Whatever. He's gone. First, uh, give me John five thirty-nine. 
that was that family's chance to rewrite that family's history and be the first generations to repent and come back to the Lord. And he just turned and went right back to the world. Um, search the scriptures, 539. Yes, sir. This is the book of John, chapter 5, verse 39. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So you want a way to escape? It said search the scriptures. Study, search the scriptures. And after you highlight up your Bible and you do all that stuff, all you got to do, I keep on saying is open it back up, and it's an open book exam. You see that big highlight with the notes next to it? Do what it's saying to do there. You see another highlight with the notes when it says don't, don't do that. As simple as that. That's the way out. I think a lot of times people fall away because they do not have a healthy fear of God or they don't believe what the Bible says. Do we all believe that at one time we ate our children? Do you know old forefather said amen behind it and still went and sinned? I mean, we say it that we believe it. We said we, we know because we said we believe the Bible. But do you really believe it? When I say do you really believe it, do you play it out in your mind that that's your child there and starvation is hitting you so bad that you begin to look at your child as a meal? God is a, he said, meditate terrors. He's not the one to play with. And we're in this ease, this time of ease. This is a time of ease for us right now. And that's when we get complacent. But when you have, when you understand the fear of God, you understand this wisdom is bittersweet. You understand what God is saying when he begins to judge you and slowly, and it's going to hit this earth again. The Bible is repetitious. The same way there was starvation during the time of Babylon, during the time of 70 AD, in these last days, grinding shall be low. There are people that's going to eat their children. <laughs> okay. When you start hearing that and start resonating that you love your children, you start thinking, I can never, I, in my mind, I, even now as I say it, I honestly can't fully understand it. I know everybody said yes, but I fully can't understand it because I can't imagine looking at my child as a meal. Most high will meditate terrors on us. That's why when it hits you and his word hits you and resonate with your spirit, we will learn to tread lightly in every actions we make. And certainly I made my gang of mistakes in this truth. But when the Lord begin to judge you for your actions, when the Lord begin to bring calamities on this earth, know that you said you had wisdom. Should have been a fair God in you. So he always makes a way out. Uh, give me um, um, uh, Timothy's 2.15. Uh, Timothy's 2.15. This is the book of 2 Timothy's chapter 2 and verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Back to what we were talking about, having a way to escape. Study to show thyself approved unto God. All scriptures given by the inspiration of God is profitable for reproof. Search the scriptures. There's always that key component. The Most High will always give you a way out of it to get away from this. All right, Go to Second Ezra again, 14 this time. 14, verse uh, 38. This is the book of 2 Ezra, chapter 14, and verse 38. And the next day, behold, a voice called me, saying, Ezra, open thy mouth, and drink that I give thee to drink. Then opened I my mouth, and behold, he reached me a full cup, which was full as it were with water, but the color of it was like fire. And I took it and drank and when I had drunk of it, my heart uttered understanding, and wisdom grew in my breast, for my spirit strengthened my memory, and my mouth was opened and shut no more. So watch this. Uh, verse 39. One more time. 
Then opened I my mouth, and behold, he reached me a full cup, which was full as it were with water. Ephesians 5.26. Well, real quick, go to Hosea 12 and 10. So we understand that this is all similitudes of what he's talking about, right? This is the book of Hosea, chapter 12 and verse 10. I have spoken also, I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. He said he spoke by the prophets, he used similitudes, meaning it says one thing, but he means something else, all right? So let's let's see what the water is talking about. Ephesians 5:26. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So the washing of water by the word, or the water is the word that he's referring to. So when Ezra opened his mouth and he drank that water, that water was the word of God. He was ingesting, taking it into his spirit, right? Let's go back. Second Ezra chapter 14 and verse 38. And the next day, behold, a voice called me, saying, Ezra, open thy mouth, and drink that I give thee to drink. Then opened I my mouth, and behold, he reached me a full cup, which was full as it were with water, but the color of it was like fire. Jeremiah 5.14. And there's another one in Jeremiah that used the word fire and word in, in its, like, like in the 20s or something like that. Let me hear it. How oh, this guy is his damn memory. Yeah. 514. Here's the file. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 14. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because he speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. Right. So the word that was in his mouth was the words of God. He said, I'll make my words in your mouth as fire. That's why it says, as is written that I might be justified in thy sayings and overcome when thou judge. Because what we're going to speak is the oracles of God. Bishop always goes over it. For men going to camp, use the words of God. Don't rewrite it. Don't rethink it. Just repeat it. That's all you got to do. Just repeat what's being said here. And you're in a safety. That's it. Let me hear it. This is the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, verse 29. Is not my word like as a fire? That's it. Mm -hmm. Save the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. That's dope. That's a good scripture right there. All right, so let's go back. Second Ezra 14 and verse 39. Then opened I my mouth, and behold, he reached me a full cup, which was full as it were with water, but the color of it was like fire. And I took it and drank. And when I had drunk of it, my heart uttered understanding, and wisdom grew in my breast, for my uh, spirit strengthened my memory. Right, so his wisdom now was strengthened his memory. Why? Because he was taking, studying, taking his word, ingesting it, you grow in understanding. And his spirit and wisdom grew in my best, and my spirit strengthened my memory. That doesn't happen by osmosis. If you don't study, you're not going to know it. Plain and simple. You have to be attentive to reading. You have to open the book. You can't close it and go like this and think it's going to. It doesn't work like that. But watch, watch this. Read on. Verse 41. And my mouth was opened and shut no more. The highest gave understanding unto the five. <laughs> The highest gave understanding unto the five men, and they wrote the wonderful visions of the night that were told, which they knew not. And they sat 40 days, yeah. and they wrote in the day, and at night they ate bread. The Most High gave them the understanding, and they wrote these words. Read on. As for me, I spake in the day, and I held not my tongue by night. And he began to utter all that he was given. Let's drop that. Go to Revelations 10. Revelations 10 and 9. This is the book of Revelations, chapter 10 and verse 9. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, 
Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Okay, so let's let's start now. So what is it talking about? Who can explain? Who wants to give a shot? All right, let me have that young man back. Now, give him, give him mic. So it's talking about uh, bishop and leadership, Shalom. It's saying uh, when you first hear the, the word of God, it's sweet. You find out you're an Israelite, it's all smiles, you're happy. Um, but when you have to start applying, you know, the commandments, you know, changing changing your old ways, that's when it becomes bitter. How, how long you been in truth now? Uh, five months. Five months. What What was it that you heard that was sweet to your ear when you heard it? Just hearing the covenants and what's all, the kingdom to come, the promises. Yeah, that was it for me. That was it for me, that we're going to rule over our enemies. Yes, sir. When I heard that, I'm like, okay, I'm sold. Cool. <laughs> Where do I sign up for it? Right. Everybody had that thing. It is right. Your answer is correct. When you first hear it, those things that trigger you, you know, that, that make you pay attention to it. And that's what lures you in. It lures you in because you hear this good news of, you know, we're, we're God's chosen people. We're going to rule one day. We won't die again. We're gonna, all these things bring you in. But then you find out what you got to do to get it now. Cyborg, very good. Another thing, in the street teaching, I always stress with you brothers, learn how to fish people in. You don't fish them in by walking by and say, you know, you're the devil. That doesn't fish people in. Be a fisher. So find things to engage them. And get them to listen. And if you get them saying yes long enough, like, you know you come from a great people, generally people are going to say yes. You know, pick whatever, you know, that you, you want, you'll never work again in your life when you reach the kingdom. You want to stop working? Who's going to say they want to continue working? You're not tired of working that dead-end job? Most of them are going to say, yeah, yeah, I'm tired of working a dead-end job. You know, you tired of us getting killed in the streets? Yeah, yeah, I'm tired of getting killed in the streets. You know, do you understand why that's happening? Now here come the transition. Why they keep on doing it? Transition. Do you know how, don't, wouldn't it be fair one day we could rule over them? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, they're going to say yes. And once you got them saying yes, this is what you got to do now. You got to put down the cigarettes. If you, you, but wait a second, you said you want that, right? You got to put down the gun, you know? You got to put down the sin. Here's the trade-off. You got to grow your beard. Living forever or growing a beard? Which one is more important? I mean, if it, all I got to do is grow it and I don't have to, yeah, yes. You got to stop eating pork. And that's how you fish them in. Okay, very good. So let's go back to this. Um, uh, verse 9. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 9. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, give me the little book. And he said unto me, take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Read. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. Stop. Psalms 119, 103. It says, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. Psalms 119 and verse 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yay, sweeter than honey to my mouth. So that's what he was tasting. The word of God, it was sweet to him. Let's go back. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 10. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Then you understand what? Uh, give me Acts 14, uh, 22. <laughs> Then when it hit the belly, it became bitter. This is the book of Acts, chapter 14 and verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Everybody understand what that means right there? Explain it. Somebody explain it. Nobody, right there in the front. Hey, Shalom Bishop, Officer Reb. The trials, the tribulations that we're going to go through, it could be losing family members, losing wives, husbands, you know what I'm saying? Different things that you go through in this walk after it becomes bitter, the things you got to apply. Right. It says through much tribulation. So that's not going to change for any one of us. Through much tribulation you enter. 
So we hear the word, it sounds good, and then you start finding out, damn, what is the cost that I got to pay for this? He tell you, it's going to be much tribulation. Now, those words don't mean nothing to somebody without wisdom, but to us, who supposedly have wisdom, we understand that there's a price to pay for it. God is not giving us anything for free. He did it once before. It didn't work out. Now he wants something back in return. And you know what that is? Your life devoted to him, which he wanted at the first time, but we didn't do it. But this time we have to work for it now. So he's telling you, to enter into the kingdom, it's going to be through much tribulation. How do we get around that? I mean, in a Christian church, it's shake your neighbor's hand. And, and that, that's not, that, no, no, that's not going to work. Not with him. You think you could do whatever you want to do, and then at the end of it, you live forever, and you got a lamb and a lion for animals. And that's not, come on, that's not reality. God is a God of equity and judgment. He's just, he's fair. But he wants, like all of us, don't we want something back in return? Don't you want from your wife loyalty, obedience from your children? Or are you going to accept less? And why would we accept God accept less? You think we could do whatever we want, be a hold to every other God in the world and come back to him? He said, he's going to accept. No, that's not how it works. God said through much tribulation, you're going to get this. So it's sweet, and then it becomes bitter. Let's go back. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 10. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Verse 11. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Oh, that was the end of it? Yes, sir. Okay. And when his, and his belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nation, tongues, and kings. You know what he's trying to tell them? Now that you got it, you understand. You're going to go up against these nations. You might have to lose your life for this. You think you're going to go up against a king and tell him that your kingdom is going to fall and another kingdom is going to rise and that's where it ends at? He's going to be all right with that? I always read that when I read about <clears throat> excuse me, Moses. It always struck me when Moses went to Pharaoh and said the things he said. But it's the last one he says, listen, God said, go tell him his firstborn is going to die. And he went to Pharaoh and said, listen, either free God's people or your firstborn is going to be killed. You think that was, you, you think you could just talk to him like that? You couldn't, they'll cut your tongue before you finish your sentence. It take a special spirit for you to go up to a man and tell him, your child is going to die, who's the heir to his kingdom. That's not no regular man. That ain't no regular man doing that. That's a man inspired of God. But imagine when, when God told him he had to go tell him, oh gosh, hey Shalom, most high Christ blessed threw me off. Uh, imagine, in my mind, I'm thinking, when you... What you said, I got to go tell him? No, you heard what I said. Go to him and tell him what I said right now. I'm going to kill him. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, um, you know. So, so he says, you're going to prophesy. Read the last verse, uh, Cap. Verse 11. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 11. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Now watch this. Jump to back to Acts 5.14. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Read on. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. They commend them unto the Lord on whom they believed. Read on. And after they had passed throughout Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down into Adaliah, and then sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them, 
and, that, and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. So after they set these elders in these churches, they went through uh, Phasida and Pamphylia and Pergia and Atalia and to Antioch. What do you think they were doing? 10 and 11. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. That's what they were doing. They were traveling throughout the regions preaching. You think they, were, you think they weren't bucking up against the leaders of those cities? We're going to read about it in a second. So you hear the word. It tastes sweet in the mouth. But then you have to deal with the hardcore reality. And you men are right now dealing with when you go out on them streets and you got to go and contend with these people. And you know, old people are the worst. That's the price to pay. And you can't be a coward. You can't be afraid to do it. It takes a special spirit to stand in them corners and scream at the top of your lungs and tell people that they're evil. And I commend every one of you that put your work in out in those corners. You're a different type of spirit, trust me. That's a different spirit on y'all. That ain't easy. And sisters, when those men walk through the doors, you should be on your feet clapping and praising God that they made it home safely. Because for sometimes I'd be amazed. I'd be like, damn, the most high has shown us favor, boy. I tell you, sidebar, we was in Haiti and we went to some voodoo festival. I'm saying this because everybody think Haiti and voodoo, but everybody do voodoo. Right? So, you know. Judah, you do it, it's called Christianity. <laughs> anyway, we was we was we went to this voodoo festival and on the on the drive, as we getting closer to it, it was so chaotic. We drove by. There was a body dead on the street, just laid in. And here's the thing, not the dead body, because I've seen dead bodies before. What it struck me was everybody was nonchalant, like it was no big deal. And I'm like, there's a body right there. Anyway, so we get down to the voodoo festival, and there's a pit you have to go into. That's the best way for me to explain it. So we're going down, Bishop. So we get down, it's like, okay, so now we're down in the middle of the voodoo. People have, and people not naked. The people screaming. It was, a, it was a sight to see. So we're trying to figure out where we're going to set up camp at. Like, we're going to set up here, Bishop. No. Right there. And I said, oh, shit. Oh, excuse my language. Damn, I'm lying. I said, oh, shoot. He put us in the middle of the pit. And all I kept on thinking, I looked around, I said, if they don't want us to leave here, we don't leave. There's no way out of there. There's one way out, but there's thousands of people. So, they began to teach, and I forgot who it was. I don't know if it was Lab or Malachi. I said, okay, they're going to churn these spirits. You know, Mar you know Lab and I to churn up them demons. And I saw seeing the demons start rising. The spirits start changing. I saw seeing dudes start getting aggressive. And I'm like, they will, this crowd, if they turn, that's it. Anyway, at the end of the day, most I gave us the victory. We came out there unscathed, turned it up in there, and I kept on thinking, it takes special spirits to go down to these places to do this kind of work. You just don't have no idea. And I just named that. I didn't name God. I'm telling you, I, Trinidad, I, I can't stand Trinidad. That's the worst camp I've ever been. Not, I, don't mean, I don't mean you people, brothers there, but them people is ignorant as hell over there. But I tell you, we was driving through Ghana, and I'm telling you, we was in a bus with a security. This dude had one rusty six-shooter. And I'm telling you, there's so many people in the street. When I say so many people that if the bus floored it, they would get stuck. They wouldn't be to drive over the people. If people want to turn the bus, they know where get they know where you're getting out of there. And I keep on saying we go to these countries and we teach these words and and even in, in, in these states here, we see brothers' cars getting shot at, man. It is listen, most high has put a spirit on you men to do this work. And that's the bitter part of it. You start realizing that every time you leave this door to do the work, your life is in jeopardy. So, sidebar for you sisters, you better praise God for the men that you have, for the brothers that you have in this truth. And every time they walk through that door, know. The Most High gave us collectively a victory, all right? Okay, sidebar. Let's go back. Uh, uh, Mark 4. Uh, 4, um, 5, and 6. This is the book of Mark, chapter 4 and verse 5. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, 
and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. We don't. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Now here's the understanding of it. Jump down to verse 16. Verse 16. And these are they, likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. It was honey to them. Oh, they received it with gladness. That's how they are. People hear this word. Yeah, a lot of people hear this word. What you mean? The white man going to captivity? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to rule forever? Yeah. Listen, you got to stop smoking weed. Ah, oh, man. But herb is from the ground, you know. It was on Solomon's tomb. Oh, come on. Here we go. Listen, we was in, we was in Cuba, and we was in the church teaching, and this, this pastor was going for everything. He, he accepted everything. I, I thought his argument was going to, he wasn't going to accept Christ was black. He accepted it. And he was fair-skinned. He laid down for all the scriptures. I'm like, this is too easy. Damn, he's not even like, he's not even bucking. And then I read the scripture about pork. And oh God, was, that's, he could not accept that. He, that's the one thing. He said, oh, no, 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 no. He's like, all of a sudden, he became a Bible scholar. Oh, give me first, give me first Timothy 4. You know, give me Mark. I'm like, how the hell you know these scriptures? You didn't question nothing else. That was the thing he heard that he could have heard. So everything else he took with gladness. And many people hear the word, it's gladness. They love what they're hearing. But then this happens. Read on. Verse 17. And have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns. Stop right there. So it says, and afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth, Here's the bitter part. For the word's sake, they immediately are offended. We know through much tribulations. So we already established that. If you got wisdom, you understand through much, there's no way around it. So when persecution or affliction comes, you should not be offended. You should understand this is the price to pay. You want wisdom, you take all of it. You take the sweet and the bitter. You're going to get both doses of it. Watch this. Uh, persecutions. Um, let's do an oath. Let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 28 and 8. This is the book of Jeremiah, chapter 28 and verse 8. The prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence. Look, look who did that. Moses did that. In the known world, Egypt was the greatest superpower on the earth. He spoke against the fall of it. In history, we read about John the Baptist. He spoke against Herod, the Maccabees, Isaiah, Paul, all the apostles. This is the job. Do you know that's what you men are doing today, right now? You're speaking, you're speaking the words of God to the demise of this kingdom? You are, you are bringing to life these scriptures, what the prophets did. Now, wait a second. Jeremiah did that, right? Read that verse again. Jeremiah 28 and verse 8. The prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence. And what did I get Jeremiah for doing that? Go to Jeremiah 32. This is what he got for that. Jeremiah 32, 1 and 2. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 32 and verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the king of Judah's house. So he was thrown in prison. For prophesying against it. He prophesied against uh, uh, Israel. And it earned him prison. Now, I don't know anybody here that think prison is a blessing. 
And wait a second, didn't it say he was put in a pit? Yeah, he was lowered down into a pit. His prison wasn't like this. His prison was a pit. It was put, I'll get to that later on. But they put him in a pit. Now, that's a prison for you. That's for doing God's work. That's that bitter for doing the work of, for doing the work of the most high. Read on. Verse 3. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Wherefore dost thou prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord? Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him mouth to mouth, and his eyes shall behold his eyes. And he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there shall he be until I visit him, saith the Lord. Though ye fight with the Chaldeans, ye shall not prosper. They didn't want to hear Jeremiah mouth. He told him, "Listen, Zedekiah, you gonna see the king. You gonna see the king of Babylon face to face. Meaning, your army will not be able to withstand him. That he's gonna witness you and see you face to face, and you're going to fall to him. This is a man who's standing in his kingdom, with his armies, his men." And here comes Jeremiah said, you know you're going to die, right? You know you're going to be carried away as a slave. And the man that's going to do it is going to come meet you right here in your land and look at you in your face and take you away. He's like, oh, this Jeremiah guy, this guy's too much. <laughs> Throw this guy into jail. Nobody wants to hear what you got to say. Here comes the bad news guy. Okay, you can do that, but it ain't going to change. But Jeremiah was charged with that job. That was his job to do. That's what he was called to do. In my mind, what I play in my mind is him saying that to him and then knowing, okay, this ain't going to end good. Like, I'm not going home tonight after, after I said this. No, try to imagine Zedekiah's face, the anger in his face, like, Yo, grab this dude. But you know what's one thing? He didn't kill him. He was afraid of him. <laughs> he, was afraid, he was afraid. He was afraid that, yeah, throw him in jail. But in my mind, I'm thinking, man, you know, you sit in the bottom of a pit. You, 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 you think? You think it was a you think it was a AC down there? You think it was nice? It's a dirt pit. I never I never seen a pit that, that's dug in the ground. It just they just decorate it and make it comfortable for you. They drop you down there and you sitting in a dark hole. Don't it say even though he did that, didn't it say it's in a chapter, isn't a chapter right there? Ah, oh, my mind, my mind, my mind. He still fed him. Um it's it's later on, it's right after that. Or uh, he gave him a portion of the meal. Just find where he fed him for me. Thirty seven, verse twenty one. Yeah, thirty seven, twenty one. Jeremiah, chapter 37, verse 21. Then Zedekiah the king commanded that they should commit Jeremiah into the court of the prison and that they should give him daily a piece of bread out of the Baker Street. Now, I'm going to tell you what's so important about that. Remember, they were going through a famine. Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem now. So the little food they had, you know, the, the common people weren't eating. They were starving to death. The king had a little piece of whatever. But he made sure you feed Jeremiah. The Most High made sure his prophets were always taken care of. And all that destruction was going on, he put his spirit on the king to make sure you feed Jeremiah. After Jeremiah prophesied against him, God put the spirit on him to make sure Jeremiah was taken care of. I know that strikes me. that the most, That's why the Most High says in Isaiah 66, my servants shall eat, my servants shall drink. Even when destruction is coming, I'm going to put the spirit to make sure they're taken care of. Now watch this. Let's let's read about that pit. Jump to chapter thirty-eight, uh, verse five. Jeremiah chapter thirty-eight, verse five. Then Zedekiah the king said, "Behold, he is in your hand, 
for the king is not he that can do anything against you. Then took they Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah, the son of Hamelech, that was in the court of the prison. And they let down Jeremiah with cords. So this little watch. Now he went, to, he went from the king's prison court to another man's prison court, and they let him down with a rope. Read on. And in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. You know what, the, you know what mire is? Look up the word mire real quick. I want you to understand. Who wants Jeremiah's life? You say you want to be Jeremiah? Yeah, you all want to be him. You all signed up for it. We all did. At a young age. At too. a young age. Look at this. A stretch or swampy or bogged down ground. Now, give me synonyms. Or what's it? A uh, situation difficult. No, I don't want that. I want sink, stuck in the mud. Dirt, soil, muddy. Okay, yes. All right, Smith. In the bottom, there was no water down there. It was mud. What else you think was down there in mud? Feces, pee. You th what do you think? Uh, listen, uh, hello. I I, I got to use the, I got to use the bathroom. You think that's what he's that's what he signed up for? You know that's what you all signed up for. Do you all understand that's what you signed up for? If you're uncertain, say you're uncertain. But do you know it? Repenting and coming to this truth and breaking a bread and do that, that you signed up to possibly live through these things? Yeah, go ahead. Feel free. Hey, a quick a glimpse of that, right? The most I showed us a glimpse of that when we have brothers when we go to Africa. We're not using just regular toilets, especially outside. We had one brother in particular, he had to use, he literally had to use a leaf. He had to use a leaf to wipe his butt. Yeah, man. So we, the most high is going to put us through it, all right? It's not, he's going to make us uncomfortable. And we're going to get comfortable when we get the kingdom. We, we, the most I'm going to turn it up on us. We, right now, we, here in America, trust, we comfortable. We, li we live a cushy life in this truth right now. Mm -hmm. You go to these other countries, boy, and reality come rushing in. And for all you sisters that is like, you know, are unhappy or think things are worse, go over to Ghana. <laughs> trust me, there's no Starbucks there. Go to Haiti. I get you. Trust me, reality will come rushing in real quick. You will worship your Lord and pray he bring you back to the United States of Babylon. <laughs> Over there, life ain't, oh gosh. You won't be thinking about no makeup. You won't be thinking about no nails. Nah, nah. Those are some hard back women there. There's some hard back women. We are, even us here, we support many of you men wouldn't want to be over there. Trust me. There's a whole different, their reality is a whole different reality. You take them and put them in a, in a, in a, in my area, they're like, oh, thank you. This is an upgrade. I got to say this. Um, we went to, where was it, Sierra Leone? It was Sierra Leone. So uh, some of the brothers came back after camp and we let them, you know, come, come take a shower. Cause some of those brothers, showering is a luxury. One brother said, I feel like the white man. He literally said that. <laughs> yeah, he said, I feel, I feel like the white man. Just because he took a shower. And I heard, I heard Sherilyn Lynn was bad there. Mm -hmm. I didn't make that trip, but I heard the conditions over there. Liberia, they have like turd on oh, the no, beach. I, swear, I meant Liberia. Yeah. Mm, 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 mm. So what did it say? Uh, verse 6, one more time, then we're going to move on. Jeremiah 38 and verse 6. Then they took they, Jeremiah, and cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah, the son of Hamelech, that was in the court of the prison. And they let down Jeremiah with cords. And in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Damn, I tell you, boy. Mm -mm -mm, mm -mm -mm. I tell you how my mind works when I read stuff like that. I'm telling you something. Um, my mind paints this picture, and I could. My mind, I'm just like, damn. Watch this, Jeremiah one. Jeremiah one, verse four. This is the book of Jeremiah, chapter one and verse four. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the out of the womb I sanctified thee, 
And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, our Lord, God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Here come the excuses. God said, I ordained you before you were born. And that's each and every one of us. Before we were born, we were ordained to be. None of us are here by chance. We're here for a purpose. We're here for an example on what you should do or what you should not do. But we're going to be used for something. But all of us was ordained for a purpose. He said, but Lord, I'm a child. What did the Lord say? But the Lord said unto me, say not, I am a child. Say, I don't want to hear that. Don't, say you, don't tell me you're a child. I, I said, I ordained you. I already told you I chose you. Now you come with excuse. God said, that's not, no, 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 no. Read on. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. So look what he told him. He says, don't be afraid of their faces, because I am with thee to deliver thee. Don't worry. It's going to be okay. I'm going to deliver you out of the situation. Now, delivering don't mean you're not going to die. Don't misunderstand. People think, no, that's not the case. But Lord said, I'm with thee, because I chose thee. Read on. Verse 9, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. So he says, see, I set thee these days over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and to plant. Think about the time Jeremiah, I think we went over this a few weeks ago. Think about the time Jeremiah was in. By this time, Babylon was done encroaching on them. Babylon was already inhabiting where we would known as Northern Kingdom by that time. So they was on our heels. He said, Jeremiah, I set thee to be over the nations. That's us today. To root up, to pull down, to destroy, and to what's the last point it says? and to plant, and to reestablish back up God's will. To root out, to pull down, you're going to get resistance. We just read that. Jeremiah went into a pit. There's going to be resistance. So when he put those words into Jeremiah's mouth, he sealed that instruction to him. He understood what? The next thing he says, don't worry. I'm here to deliver you. He sealed the instructions in him. And when he got the instruction, he realized, oh, there's a price. Don't worry. Shh, shh, shh. Don't tell me about you a child. Shh, it's all right. I'm going to deliver you. What do you think Jeremiah understood at that point? Oh, there's a price to pay for this. I don't want to hear about I'm a kid, God said. You're going you're gonna to take down and dismantle all this and replant what I'm telling you to replant. Read on. Verse 11, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. No, I don't want that. Let's, let's uh, move on. Let's go from that uh, to Matthew 13. <clears throat> Matthew 13, 54. This is the book of Matthew, chapter 13 and verse 54. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brother James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, now watch this. I, I, and we're going to come back here again. But look what he says here. He says, I started with ver what verse again? 53? 54? 54. It says, And when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence this man with this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? What is he trying to what, what are you trying to say about him? Is not that the carpenter's son? They're trying to say he's a boy. That's, that's, that's 
my same son. Who's he, who's this guy? When you become a man, you stand in your own. When you have children, they grow up. They got to build their own name, their own house. Christ was healing, and they still try to diminish him and make him like he was nothing. Oh, that's the carpenter's son. Is that his brother and his sister there? This is the Messiah they're talking about. Oh, that's just the carpenter's son over there. It's a little kid. Who is he? Watch this. Um... I lost a place. Um, I lost my place. Uh, 54. Uh, 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Is And his brethren, uh, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? They were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country. So a prophet will get honor, but it won't be amongst his own country, his own people. You all see that, especially you captains that travel. You will go to another country, and you, I tell you, we've been to countries that I'm, I'd be totally amazed. You say Christ is black, and the whole crowd is is cheering. They are begging you. We were someplace, or two different places. One place, they was begging us not to stop teaching. I never in my life, in all my years in camp, ever heard people say, please don't stop. And we was there for hours. I'm like, damn, I mean, this is eight hours going. They're like, don't, don't stop. What are we going to do when you leave? This after one day of teaching out in camp, what are we going to do? I'm like, damn. Here they be like, they want you out there to get it. You can't wait. They be like, the dudes be out there listening and say, Herp and read Matthews 26. <laughs> it's like, oh man. We was in the camp and a sister said one time, So, what is your purpose for you guys out here? And we told her, We hired to you know, help her. People said, So, are you guys planning to come back again or is this like a one time deal? I said, no, we plan to establish something. And we did establish a school in that city, it was in Ghana. Got it, yeah. Um, and then she said, okay, so you plan to continue? We said, yeah. She said, okay, tomorrow you can come. I have a school over here that I teach, and you guys come and teach this over at the school. I thought she was, well, first of all, she was only 19 years old. She looked hard in the face. She looked older. But she heard the word. It resonated to her, and she said, tomorrow you come, teach my students this right here. Lo and behold, years later, we have a school in that city. But they receive the word. Here, over here, sometime in your own cities, you brothers who have leadership in your camp, man, appreciate what you got. I'm telling you. When I say leadership, you got captains and deacons and bishops, man. Take full advantage of that. Because you go to another camp with an IUIC, and they'll lay it out for you. And in your own camp, eh, that's just, just a Catherine Isaac, whatever. Someplace else, people appreciate it. Especially schools that don't have Upper leadership, when you come, they really appreciate having you there. I went to, well, I got started. I went to school one day. I drove all the way out there, but I must still be salty. I got to repent. I ain't salty no more. But I drove out there just to go see them on my own dime, my own time. I pulled up there. It's Friday evening. I'm like, where's the brothers at? Ah, oh, and our brothers are not making us go. I said, what you mean? It's Friday. Nobody's working. There's nothing said. You guys knew I was coming. You didn't have nothing for me to eat? Ah, oh, nah, you know. I said, okay, cool. I'll get my own food. I said, okay, so where's the brother? Let's go through the scriptures. Nobody showed up. Wow was not the word. I said, oh, cool. Okay. I guess everybody knows everything here. So if everybody knows me, no, I'm an early riser. Before that sun cracked that sky, I got in that car. I didn't call. <laughs> they called me like, oh, so you ready for Sabbath service? What Sabbath service? I'm, I'm, back, I'm back in my seat. I'm out. Got to be joking. Okay. Uh, what was we at? Um, Matthew 13. Verse two, uh, 57, Cap. Matthew 13, verse 57. And they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. He did not many mighty 
works there because the people did not believe. The people of his own city who he raised up around did not believe him. They didn't want to hear what he had to say. Then people turned on him. To my Christ, people he's supposed to be close with, they all turned on him. Not all of them, but you know what I mean, right? You know how bitter that must be to be there and you in your city? You're like, oh, that's Mr. So-and-so. And this, you know, you might try to wrap your mind around the city you're in and you know everybody. That's a guy who, you know, his, they milked the cows. That was the one who made the horseshoes. That was the one who made the bread. And they all know you. And then now all these people are turning against you. And all this for the, for the Lord's sake. Ah, he ain't nobody. That's a carpenter's son. That, that is Mother Mary. And that, who do you think he is? He's like, man, I gotta, I'm out. I gotta do this someplace else. These people don't want to hear the word. Matthews 10. Cap, you want to say something? Oh, uh, Matthews 10, 16. The book of Matthews, chapter 10 and verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. He tell me, listen, I'm sending you as I'm gonna send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Read on. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake. For a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. So, try to, again, I'm telling you, wrap your mind around it. Christ is talking to the apostles. He says, listen, I'm going to send you a sheep before these wolves. Automatically, my thought process, wolves, they teeth are sharp. They come and tear stuff up. He says... And you better be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Know how to navigate and how to deal with them, how to speak, when to speak, how to grieve with your adversary. These are thoughts that go through my mind. Now on the receiving end, he's telling them that, and they're like, yo, so you're telling me you sent me out there to get tore up? Yeah, that's what I mean. I'm sending you out there, and these men are going to try to devour you. They're going to beat you. They're going to throw you in prison. Do you understand that? This is the price you pay for the wisdom that I gave you. It was sweet at first, right? But now here's the bitter part of it. Read verse 1. Verse 20? No, verse 1, 10 and 1. Verse 1. Matthew 10, verse 1. And when, we, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Verse 7. And as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what do you think he was doing? What do you think he was doing? Well, these apostles, you think the Herodians didn't hear them? You think, you think uh, uh, the, the um, Pharisees, Sadducees didn't hear him preaching this word? He said, I'm sending you as sheep out in the midst of wolves. You're going to go in the streets today. You're going to be out in front of police, FBI, CIA, gang members, the, the, the sodomite crews, the, the church. And we got to operate different. We can't be carnal and move on their levels. We're the sheep and those are the wolves out there. And get ready. They're going to beat you. Watch this. What verse did you stop that before? Um, uh, verse 21? Verse 21. What, was that, what did we stop before? Was it 21 or 20? Oh. No, start with verse 19. Verse 19. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. Read on. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. Read. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child. And the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Imagine, de imagine Christ tell you this. Listen, your family going to turn on you, some of you, and cause some of you to be put to death. I keep on saying we read it like it's words on a page. But when you got wisdom and you know these words are real, it become bitter. You start thinking about, yo, you telling me that there's a possibility my mother turn on me, my father turn on me, my child will turn on me and cause me to be put to death? Yeah, that's what I said. 
All right, guys, so you go out there and do the work now like I just told you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I read this stuff sometimes. I'm like, yo, Christ was not playing with them. All right, yeah. So I'm trying, I'm trying to picture myself saying, okay, so we got the plan. Oh, uh, yeah, you go now. I'm like, yeah, go. Now? Yeah, go and preach this gospel in all nations and take everything that's coming to you. Mm, mm, mm. Read on. Verse 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Wasn't Christ hated? He didn't get no honors on until they hated him in the city. We read like, like uh, that's a carpenter's son. They hated him in his own town where he came and rest his head down at. The people in the city hated him. He's like, damn, you can't get honor in your own city. Miss Gertrude, I know you. Shut up, nigga. <laughs> Not Miss Gertrude. <laughs> Miss Gertrude Israel. Yeah, she ha he was hated the same way. He said, and you're going to be hated. Indeed, you're going to drink of my cup. That's why Chris said, I didn't have a to put my fox have holes and birds have nests. He had no safe dwelling place where he was at. This is the price of wisdom. And you learn this, and guess what? It's going to get turned up. Read on. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Damn. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. You're going to be hated. Everybody's going to hate you. Everybody's not going to like you. Everybody's going to hate your guts for this truth. But if you can endure, the kingdom is yours. Again, his words on the page. When you live in it and everybody, all your family, your friends, everybody hates you. They may not openly say it, but they'll, if they have a chance to, 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 uh, to undermine what you're doing, they'll do it. That's why he said, jump to verse 36. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. That's why he said in the same chapter, a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Imagine them talking, preaching this gospel, and saying that this kingdom is going to fall. All you wicked priests and what you're teaching is going to fall. All this is going to be undermined. They were doing the same thing Jeremiah was doing. We're doing the same thing they were doing. So if you're doing the same thing, you kind of got to expect the same results. You understand that? Hold this. Go back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1, one more time. Well, if you, if you got to expect the same thing, if you're doing the same thing, you got to expect the same response, right? Then, you, then do this. Verse 17. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 17. Thou therefore gird up thy loins, and arise, and speak unto them all that I command thee, be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. And here's the thing now. He said, listen, you better not be dismayed before their faces, lest I confound thee. You better not be moving scary because Christ said, God said, if you act like you're scared, that means you don't believe. You're unconfident. You're not, you're not confident in what he's saying. He said, and at that point, I'm going to back up off of you and you're on your own. So if you're going to do this, you better do this with that intensity. So your brothers on the street, you better not be in the street and be too late now. You better just speak the word with fire. You don't talk about black people. I had to catch myself. I was gonna say I was gonna say a word I can't say. They smell female dog in you. N Negroes can smell that. If they sense a little weakness in your little shifty eye, looking down, not firm in your tone of your voice, they will swallow you in these streets. Not that you got to be a nigger, but you better know, you better meet that intensity with that word of God with confidence because show them a little bit of weakness, a nigger will run you off of that corner. And I don't care what city you give me in America, if there's niggers there, they will run you off that corner. They got to see something in you that's different than these other dudes. Okay, that's being said. Really sweet on. Verse 18. Yeah. For behold... I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar and brazen wall against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, 
against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. So he's telling you already, listen, they're going to fight you. Then, he then Christ telling them, listen, you're going to lose your life. People are going to throw you in prison. They're going to try to kill you, murder you, put you to death. He's, t he's telling you they're going to fight against you. So prepare yourself. This is the bitter part of what we're swallowing. So get, again, all those good times when we get together and we take photos and I said, okay, let's see if you ready. Let's see if you can keep that energy. <laughs> let's see. Let's see when it pop off. Or are you running and leaving everybody behind? Ah, you, you're gone. You're down the street. You go. <laughs> What's the best security to have in camp to watch your back? Anybody know? A brick wall. <laughs> Trust me, a brick wall. I always, in my, in my mind, I always wonder, the person behind me watching my back, I hope he's really paying attention. And I hope if it's go down, he'll at least say, hey, there's something behind you, then leave me. I always, my, I always run my mind, is the person behind me, because I can see what's in front of me. But I can't see behind me. So I'm expecting you behind me to at least give me the heads up. Hey, there's a bat. You know, I just, that's how my mind works. So if you're ever behind me, just, just give me the heads up if that's the case, all right? Can I count on you, brothers? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's sound confident in the office. You can, count, you can count on me. I'll tell you. There's a bat. Ten. Back to Matthew's ten. Verse 36. No, what I want this, what, what was in Matthew's 10 that I was thinking again? Just give me a second. Just bear with me. I'm sorry, Matthew 16. 16, 16, 24. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Look what he says here. He says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. If you come after Christ, Christ said, You have to put me first and what my desires are. And my desires for you is to go out and go teach this world, go out against the enemies of your people, Tell your people the wickedness they're doing and prepare that some of you are going to die, be in prison, lose everything you have, and you have to be willing for this. You have to be willing to do this. You have to deny yourself for him. And he's telling you what you got to go through. Did you count the cost? Because it make no sense starting it and then you don't finish it. So he says, um, what verse was that again, 24? Verse 25? Verse 25. For whosoever will save his life make shall... It, whosoever shall make excuses. We don't. Who, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. He says, you got to be willing to give it all up and trust that. He says, I got you. Like he told Jeremiah, I'm going to deliver you, Jeremiah. It's going to be all right. Some of you are going to die. He said, those that die in Christ, you're going to rise first. It's going to be all right. You don't lose. Remember, we started this in the beginner's class. When you die, that ain't the death. There's something after that. I forgot how it was worded, but there's something after that. He said, you get punished after death. So he said, after death, there's something else going on. I could bring you back. 
Don't worry about it. Don't worry about this, this mortal body that I gave you. Guess what, buddy? I gave you that body. I, I put the soul inside of you. I got something else. Don't worry about it. Just do what I said. Don't be afraid. Don't tell me you're a child. Don't make no excuses. Just go out there and just get ready to do what I'm telling you to do. The cost to be a prophet, the cost to have God's wisdom, it's a heavy price to pay. And all these classes right now is preparing us for those days. Because we ain't seen those days yet. We haven't seen those evils days yet. It ain't hit us. But when it does hit us, you better go back and remember these scriptures that you've heard, that you've studied, that you highlighted up. You better remember them. Because it's going to come. All right, so we are. Verse 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. That's what I believe. He's going to return, and he's going to reward every man. So if you die, he's going to reward you. If you, if you didn't give up your life, he's going to reward you too. Read on. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Okay, that's... Let's go back. In that time period, he was referring to his returning after his three days, after he died and he came back. Some people think there's people alive from back then till now. No, that's not what it's talking about. All right, Philippians 3. We're going to wrap it up. In a, give me a, uh, a little bit. Philippians 3, verse 7. Lose your life. Deny yourself. 3, and, three 7. The book of Philippians, chapter 3, and verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ? Ye doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Oh, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, for the excellency for the knowledge of Christ Jesus is his wisdom. And for his wisdom, he count Everything lost. It's one or the other. Read on. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, <laughs> and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So think about, think about uh, Paul writing this. Paul was well off financially. He was a man of status in Jerusalem. He had a name for himself. He came up under some of the greatest teachers of those, of those times. And then he learned Christ. And he knew in that day when he learned Christ, he couldn't deny what he learned. He understood in that day, he loses everything. His home, his prestige, his wealth, his respect, all the relationships he had with people throughout the city that knew him. He had the air of the high priest. He was able to, be, not everybody was going to the high priest and talking to him like that. He was able to commute. They knew who he was. He was a man of reputation. And to serve God and Christ and to receive that excellency, he had to lose everything. How many of us are ready to do that? You think Paul didn't lose family members? close friends that he had for years, he had a relationship, he had to give all that up. How many of us are ready for that? Mm. Jump from, yeah, go ahead. And you know the, the great thing about the forefather Paul, because remember what the scripture says, it says Christ showed him these things that was going to happen. Yeah. So he see, he's seen himself being afflicted, all the tribulations, him uh, later being uh, decapitated. He's seen all of that. Right now, we, we read it, and our faith allows us to envision the things to come, but Christ actually showed Paul. Paul seen himself losing his head, and he still went straight forward. He didn't give up the fight. Hey, look, you just said that. Look at my arm. My hair, my arm stood up. The hair that, to, to, to think that he told him, listen, I'm going to tell you how you're going to die. None of us have experienced that yet to say we're being told. But he told, listen, what's going to happen to you? And Paul's like, I, I kind of joy. He's like, I, he said, I'm ready. I'm ready. Only reason I'm still here because I still got a job to do, but I've been ready to go. What was Paul? What was he? What was this man? He's a superhero. 
That's my superhero. These all four four these men were larger than life. You tell me you're gonna be bound and go to Jerusalem, you're gonna go to your death. Yeah, hurry up. Uh, yeah, that's mine. Yeah, I know. Let's get this thing going. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I know, I know, I know, I know. Just this let's, let's let's get to it. Um Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 11. Watch this. 23. Listen to Paul. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. He said, in labors, more abundant. Listen, I need two readings on this because I want to do this quick. Um, somebody give me. Because I want to cap, I want you to stay right here. Somebody give me uh, Acts, um, Acts 16 and 1. So I want you to read, Cap, mm -hmm. Isaac, read 11, 23 uh, through 26. Yes, sir. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Man. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren. Read on, read on. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, Knoweth that I lie not in Damascus, the governor under Aratus, the king, kept the city of Damascians with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. <laughs> and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. So who want, who, who want that? Who, who's ready for, for that right there? Now watch this. Let's go back again. Uh, 23. I want some. I want you to read twenty three. I want someone to give me Acts sixteen verse one. Second Corinthians eleven and verse twenty three. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant in stripes above measure in prisons, more frequent in deaths oft. Okay, so give me uh, hold stay right there. Give me Acts sixteen one. The book of Acts chapter sixteen verse one. Then came he to Derby and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there, named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed. But his father was a Greek. Jump to verse 4. Verse 4. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for the, to keep, that were ordained for the apostles and elders, which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith, and increased in number daily. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the reg region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they passed by Mysia, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, losing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samotria, and the next day to Neopolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of the part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. Jump to verse 22. Verse 22, and a multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Stop, Who, so, stop, so wait a second. Just, just, what, I, what struck me when I read this was the cities they went over. Damn, he went from, he went, I'm just going to jump through real quick. They went from light, from Derby, uh, 
They came to, to he came to Derby and to Lystra, then went to Fenfrigia, then went to Galatia, then then he was uh, forbidden to go to Asia, but went to Messiah, then Bithynia, then uh, he went to Troas, then Macedonia, then he went from Macedonia, he went to uh, Troas again, then to Samothracia, then to Nepalius, then to uh, uh, Philippi, and I didn't even read on. He went to Lydia, then back to Thyatira, and then after all that, when he went through these cities, they got beat. <laughs> Let's go back to Corinthians. 11, verse 24. 20, 20, oh, prisons. Um, okay, let's just go on 24. I, I, I got to finish this off. Yes, more. sir. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, so save uh, one. Of his own people, he got beat by the heathens, and then when he got around the Jews, that's why he had to get let down in a basket. He got beat. How many times? Five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Five times he received 40 stripes. Five times 40 is 200 minus one. He got 199 w lashes by his own people, the Jews. That's why I said when Paul, when, it, when the spirit was given to him to understand, damn, he understood the magnitude. I, I'm telling you, the aneurysm. This man had to have, no, you know what I'm about to have to go do? I'm turning against everything. These people are going to try to kill me. Paul was hauling them off to prison when he was before he converted. And now I'm turning to Christ? You think that wasn't bit in the stomach? Damn. I can't go back to Jerusalem like that. You think Paul's walking through Jerusalem freely? They're letting this man down in baskets, hiding him. They wanted to kill this man. All those old relationships was all done, finished. Was it going back to that stuff? That's the count. That's the price you got to pay. You better count the cost when you say you believe this stuff. So you're traveling through these cities, doing the work. Okay, and then you get beat in the city, you get thrown in prison. Then I come back to the Jews and I got to get 199 beatings from them. Paul didn't have no. Paul was. But that's the price he had to pay for the stuff he did too. So that's something else. But you understand the point. Mm, 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 mm. Let's go back to um, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 26. Oh, no, no, uh, 25. Thrice was I beaten with rods. <laughs> Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Damn, suffered shipwreck, Acts 27. And we just read that uh, about the beatings in uh, Acts 16. Acts 27, uh, verse 41 to 44. The book of Acts, chapter 27, verse 41. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship around, aground, and the forepart stuck fast. It remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves, and the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they would, which would, could swim should cast themselves with first into the sea and get to the land. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Okay, so watch this. You go shipwreck in a sea and the... Um the guards said, you know, we got to kill him because the law back then, Roman law, was that if anybody escaped, you give your life for their lives. But he wouldn't do it just because of Paul. Paul wasn't running from his death. He knew what Rome meant to him. And because of Paul, because of their relationship, uh, the respect they had for Paul, they said, this man is too honorable to run. And they believe Paul can control those men from running either. He said, no, because of Paul, no, nah, don't kill him. Now you're on a board in the middle of the sea at night on a piece of wood. All this for the gospel of this truth. And the most I still saw in favor, don't kill him out there. He still have a purpose to serve. If they would have killed Paul out there, do you know many of these books wouldn't have been written? What do you think Paul was writing these letters? I am saying books, sorry, these letters. What do you think he was writing that? In prison in Rome. He was in Roman prison writing all these letters to Galatians places. 
Mm, most high is working the work. I tell you, most high is a master chess player. Okay. Uh, so that's why Paul says this. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 4, 17. Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now you understand why he calls it a light affliction he went through. Because he know for the kingdom, it's a light affliction. Jump up to verse 9. Verse 9. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Now you understand why he says that for persecuted but you know i'm not forsaken this stuff is a light affliction that's how paul process what he had to go through to his death as a light affliction somehow he's able to process that bitter part very well to me because it just sounds bitter but he's able to his mind he understood that all i'm going through this is a light affliction my death is a light affliction he was, Paul was looking for his death. He wasn't running from it. He was running to it. But he had to believe that he's going to be rise again. That's what he said. I, I come bold to the throne. He said, man, there's a crown waiting for me. That's a bad man. All the prophets to me, they, these men are my superheroes. Every last one I read, these men, these are men are larger than life. This is my Batman, Robin, my Superman, whatever you want to call them, my Thanos, I don't know, do you guys, I don't, I don't watch cartoons. Isn't he like a superhero? Mm. He's a villain. Huh? He's a villain. I mean, he, he destroyed everything, right? Yeah. I like him. Destroy this whole shit. Destroy, I like him. Was he a bad guy? Really? Mm. Oh, okay, whatever. I thought he was cool. He wasn't. He was fighting for his people. Oh, I liked him then. I, I knew I'd like him for some reason. Yeah, that dude was, he was bad. Good, bad. But the point was, Damn, he knew what he was going to. Uh, um, uh, Romans 5. We're going to wrap it up in a second. Five, five and three. The book of Romans, chapter five and verse three. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. So now you understand, right? So not only so, we glory in tribulation. So when tribulation comes, we're supposed to be glorying it. God sees that I'm fit. He believes enough in me that I can handle this. That's why he chose me. He chose me because he knows that I can endure this. Mm. So we glory in tribulations, read on. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. It's just an exercise to build your faith. All that you go through is an exercise to build your faith. For what? For a greater trial. A little bit here. And once you conquer that, I got some little more for you to deal with, right? A little bit more. That's what he did with Paul. Ah, you lose everything. Ah, you're going to get beaten over here. Ah, you're going to get beaten by the Jews. Ah, you're going to be cast in prison. All that's prepared him. It's time for you to die. By that time, Paul, I've been through so much, man, whatever. <laughs> My faith is strong. I have faith. I'm going to get the kingdom. Henceforth, there's a crown laying for me. Oh, so bitter it is. So watch this. Acts 10. Okay, who's been here under five years? Okay, under 10 years. Okay. Do you know something? Watch this. <laughs> Luke, give me Luke 10, verse 2. This is the book of Luke, chapter 10 and verse 2. Start verse 1. Yes, sir. Verse 1, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whither he himself would come. Right. He sent them out to do the work. We don't. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the labor is a few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Do you know something, brothers? I'm tell you something. Do you know we prayed for y'all to come here? We pray for you laborers to come into this harvest. Many of you that's here right now, we was praying. You didn't know that, right? We was praying. Send more, more laborers. Laborers in the harvest. We was laborers. Lord, send them. He sent them. You're that. Now it's time to go to work, laborers. This is the job. We prayed for laborers to come into this body. 
and the Most High answered our prayers. Oh. So now you call into this harvest, right? Watch this. One chapter back, chapter 9. I want you to read the last verse. This is Luke chapter 9 and verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, no man, having put he no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Okay, we prayed for you and God sent you all. So you're the laborers that's pushing this plow. If you look back now, you're not fit for the kingdom. You understand it, right? There's no turning back. It's not this. That's it. We prayed for you. God sent you. That means you approved of God. You're going to take everything that comes along with this, good and bad. But if you put your hand to that plow and you decide you want to look back and you don't want to lose your life for his sake, you don't deny yourself, count everything as done, then mm, you ain't fit for the kingdom. Shouldn't have prayed for you. <laughs> Too late now. You're in it. A couple more scriptures. I'm done. Watch this. Judges. I mean, you know, I, I'll end it on this one. Judges 5. So we wanted to come out. We, we came out of Egypt, right? And we wandered in the wilderness for all those years, 40 years. You don't think it was tired of wandering? We make it to the promised land. We're here now. Let me get judges with you. I'm not even with you. Five, verse 13. This is the book of Judges, chapter 5 and verse 13. Then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. So th now this, I'm, I'm going to set this, this, this scenario. This is um, uh, Deborah and Barak when we was in the land fighting, dealing with the heathens. Watch this. We're trying to take, we're trying to take, encroach on the land and take all place that God has given us, right? Take back the land. Read on. Verse 14. Out of Ephraim was there a root of them against Amalek. After thee, Benjamin among thy people. Out of Machir came down governors. And out of Zebulon, they that handled the pen of the writer. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. You understand what's being said right now? Anybody understand what's being said? Who doesn't understand by show of hands? Okay, let's go back. Okay, let's start with verse um, 14. Out of Ephraim was there a root of them against Amalek. So out of the tribe of Ephraim came up a root of Ephraim that fought against Amalek. Read on. After thee, Benjamin among thy people, out of Machir came down governors, and out of Zebulon they that handled the pen of the writer. So out of Benjamin and Zebulon came men, and Zebulon they were recorders. They recorded the wars that was going on. Read on. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley. And these were the footmen that went into the valley to fight. Read on. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. But in Reuben, there was, div there was division and thoughts of heart. They were unsure what they should do. Double-minded. Read on. Why abodest thou among the, sh the sheepfolds? To hear the bleedings of the flocks? While we at the war, they saying, Reuben, why are you sitting amongst the sheep foes? You, had, you, you, you tend to the sheep. You understand the price you had to pay to get the land was you had to go take it and kill everybody on it now. Hell, you ain't no time for the sheep. We go out to war, and brother's like, oh, you know, I'm going to stay back in the kids' room. Hmm. Oh, gosh, are you, are you serious? <laughs> get him a head covering. Friggin', I was going to war, and you freaking twiddling your thumbs. Ah, sing me a, you know what, that's the brother you have, sing me a song and dance for me when we come back from war. Give me some wine, we finish war, just dance. Do one of those, those shuffles you guys do, or whatever you do. Sing, you freaking, oh gosh. Oh, 
Lord, Lord, don't ever give me that spirit. Hate to hear people talking about war and you ain't been in the war. You meant that war? Oh, no, I didn't make that one. You meant that war? I wasn't at the war. You meant that? Oh, you just go be at the Titus 2 meetings. Read on. Read that verse again. Verse 16. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleedings of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Oh, read on. Gilead abode beyond Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ships? Dan didn't even get off the ships. They stayed back on the land. These two stay on land. Yeah, boy, read on. Asher continued on the sea, shore and abode in his breaches. Asher got off them boats and got on that shore and got in the breaches to the war. Read on. Zebulon and Naphtali were people that jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. And Zebulon and Naphtali, they jeoparded their lives for this truth. So I'm going to end it on this scripture right now. Give me um, Acts 14, 28. Acts 14, 20. Oh, Luke 14. I'm sorry. I'm going to say Acts. Luke 14, 28. This is the book of Luke, chapter 14 and verse 28. For which of you intending to build a tower? I'm, I'm sorry, uh, 31. Verse 31. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able to when, whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Don't you plan and count the cost? Can you meet an enemy that might be more f formidable, than, how you say the word? formidable than you? You don't count the cost? That's us. Look at us little numbers. Look what we're going up against. We count the cost and saying, are we prepared? How do you know you're prepared? You better make sure your mind is right, that you know that you got God and the angels defending you. And you ready to fight this to the bitter end. You know what? You could take my life. There's another person that can do the same thing I can do and maybe even do it better than me. You can't kill us. You can't get rid of us. I pass this mic. There's another teacher that can bring out the word. Another teacher. One of you, the, the word keep on. You don't break us. You know why? Because you're killing a man, but you can't kill an ideology, how people think. You raise your children to come up after you doing the same work, speaking the same thing, be fiercer than you. We've done count the cost, and we know we're not going to lose. There's no losing for us. It's a rigged fight. <laughs> I love that. Lord said, listen, there's no way we can lose. The only way you lose is if you give up. Ah, oh, man. Yeah, read on. Verse 32, or else. While the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. Nah, we ain't making no peace. We don't. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Yeah, we we're not we're not we're not making no no what's the word I use again? No uh, uh conditions of peace. We want all. We want the kingdom. We want everything. We want, we're not sharing it. It ain't no, no do, nothing. It's one king, Christ. We're his disciple. The earth is us and everybody else in slavery. If we don't get that, we don't win. That, nothing else. All right. But it's a price to pay for it. All right. So I pray everybody out there that you got some from today's class, that you receive it. Stay tuned. Bishop is coming on at 5 o'clock East Coast time. Stay strong in the Lord. We used to scream black power. While Heron was pushed, but at the end of the day, nothing's in vain. IUIC has been given a vision. The tents of Judah has risen. Many has attempted the mission. Minor murmuring, omitting, and missing the mark. Just reading that he had the flame of fire in his eyes gave us the spark. We on Paul's mission. We out on the road. Purple and gold from Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Ghana, Sierra Leone. 144,000 boots banging, concrete crackling. These are how our men repented at heart. The scriptures is proof. IUIC, we deliver the truth.